My invited speaker today is Dr. Clee Routledge, an existential psychologist and the Arden and Donna Hetland Distinguished Professor of Business at North Dakota State University, the director of the Psychology of Progress Project, a faculty scholar at the Sheila and Robert Chaley Institute for Global Innovation and Growth, a senior research fellow at Archbridge Institute, and an editor for Profectus, a periodic web-based magazine focused on civilizational progress and human flourishing. Our topic of discussion is nostalgia and nostalgic experience. Nostalgia is generally defined as a sentimental longing or wistful affection for the past. We started by summarizing the concept's long history of three millennia, where it received different characterizations, and then we moved to how people understand and experience nostalgia today. While nostalgia is a past-oriented emotion that has implications for the present, as it leads to increments in self-esteem, it also has implications for the future. The second part of the discussion moved toward technology, where we talked about the possibility of using immersive technologies to experience nostalgic moments. Here is the show. Hello, Clay. Welcome to the show. It's nice to have you here. Hello, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you are very well known for your work on nostalgia. How did you get to this great yet challenging topic of research? When I was in university, you know, many years ago as an undergraduate, the very first research experiment I ever tried to do, I say try because, you know, I was, I was an undergraduate student. I didn't really know what, you know, what I was doing. But the, the very first study I, I was designing myself was really focused on how people subjectively experience time. So I was always fascinated with perception of time. Like, why does it feel like time is fast sometimes? And why does it feel like it's slow? And that sort of stuff. Of course, that doesn't really have anything to do with nostalgia, but that, but that was the beginning of my interest in you know, human sub subjective experience with time. And then I went to graduate school to work on my PhD. And really my work there was in an area of what, what's called existential psychology, which is you know, about human self-consciousness and our, our cognitive sophistication, which renders us able to really think about, not just reflect on the self, but think about big, to big topics, like the, what makes life meaningful and so forth. And so in that space, I was interested in the human ability to mentally time travel into the future in particular. So when we think about the big goals that energize us, you know, we're, we're looking down the road into the future and we're, you know, we're planning for tomorrow and that's very inspirational, but being able to think about the future also means that we can think about our own vulnerabilities in particular, our mortality. And so I became really interested in, in that, that challenge, right? Like the future is hopeful and exciting and goal oriented, but it's also terrifying and anxiety provoking. Um, it's uncertain. So that was really my early work was, was focused on how do humans grapple with existential questions and fears about the future. And then doing that work, I really started to think about, well, people don't just mentally time travel into the future, they travel into the past. And those two things might be connected uh, at some level to the extent that when we are thinking about things in the future that make us feel uncertain or worried or anxious, that might actually trigger us to, to travel back in time to times that are com comforting or reassuring. And so my very first work on nostalgia was really about the possibility that it's, it, it's kind of a fear about the future that might provoke us to turn to the past as a way to restore some sense of uh, psychological stability. And so that, that was the beginning of it. Yes, very interesting. And we are going to get back to this connection between nostalgia, which apparently seems to be connected to the past. We are going to get uh, back to it when we're going to talk about the connection between nostalgia and the future. But how do you define nostalgia, first of all? And what exactly does nostalgic experience entail? If you look at a 
dictionary definition, for instance, it'll it'll say something like, nostalgia is a sentimental or wistful longing for the past. So it's a very, very generic short definition. It's pretty good. Now, when we study nostalgia, you know, another way of thinking about defining it is what are people actually experiencing when they feel nostalgic? So if you ask people to detail a nostalgic experience and how it makes them feel, well, what is the content of that? And that can really like fill in, I think, the the information about what nostalgia is. So it turns out, you know, now we've recruited thousands and thousands of participants. And what we find is people's experience of nostalgia is really involves reflecting on, so there's that, that memory component, reflecting on a past experience, typically that they find personally meaningful or valuable. It's more often than not social. So most nostalgic experiences involve time spent with loved ones or, you know, friends, family, and there's an emotional component too. So nostalgia, you know, that gets back to dictionary definition of a, a sentimental feeling, right? So nostalgia has this like warm feeling for the past, but what I think is pretty cool about nostalgia is its emotional complexity. So it's not just a happy memory. It's a memory that makes us feel warm in a lot of ways, but also has a tinge of sadness or loss. So it's a, it's a bittersweet, emotionally ambivalent or complex emotional experience that has that positive feeling, but also with a tinge of loss or sadness. Because we're after all, it's about a past and there are things about the past that we just can't, re, you know, we can't reclaim. Um, there are certain things that we could perhaps repeat at some level, like maybe you're nostalgic for a particular vacation you went on. But even if you plan that vacation <laughs> again, it's not going to be identical. It's not going to be the same. There's something that's lost. And so that, that feeling of loss and you know, that tinge of sadness is a component of it. But it's really overwhelmed by a feeling, I think, of, of gratitude, like an appreciation for time or an experience. And so that, that emotional complexity wrapped around that memory of the past is really what that that's highly social and meaningful is really what captures, I think, the nostalgia subjective experience for most people. So you start with the dictionary definition of nostalgia, but in your research, you mentioned that the concept has a history of about three millennia where it received different characterizations. How do you explain such a wide range of interpretations and manifestations? And how can these different approaches be reconciled? They are, they are pretty extreme, some of them. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. That's a really good question. And it's a wild history. I mean, it's, it's a totally wild history. So if you go all the way back to when the term nostalgia was, was coined in the late 1600s by, well, really Swiss medical student and then a physician, it really, at the beginning, it, it was considered really a brain disease. So, you know, you had these soldiers who had come down from their Alpine homes to, to fight wars in the plains of Europe, and they were experiencing great homesickness and loss and, and sadness and anxiety, and, you know, had all so sorts of symptoms that w were diagnosed as nostalgia. Um, so nostalgia was originally really viewed as like a form of homesickness and a very and considered a brain disease. If you go, so go back to the late 1600s, and that's the beginning. You fast forward all the way to today, and we think of nostalgia as happy and positive and a way to sell people products. Um, you know, there's a big marketing industry around nostalgia. So, so yeah, there's these extreme views. Well, if you go along, you know, if you if you follow this path from back then to now, what you'll see is not, certainly not a, a perfect story arc. But you'll see like a gradual move from a disease model of thinking to nostalgia as more of a, of a psychological resource that's very, very helpful. But that, you know, that, that final turn didn't really happen until, you know, the late 20th century. Um, and so what, what I think happened, this is one, one theory. I don't know this for sure because history is hard to interrogate. <laughs> but one theory is that, well, in the past, you know, they weren't doing careful experimentation or, you know, rigorous empirical studies. And so what was happening is they were just seeing that there were that these, these, this longing for the past and really longing for home 
was correlated with all these bad things like sadness, anxiety, loss. And so what they assumed was the nostalgia caused the pain, right? But another possibility, of course, is the pain is the reverse is true, right? That anxiety and, and fear and loss, you know, these soldiers are fighting in wars, separated from loved ones and home, that they caused them to feel nostalgic. And nostalgia actually might have been helping them deal with those feelings in some way. You know, we don't know, we don't have a time machine, can't go back and run those experiments. But that's one possibility. So another possibility our conception of nostalgia has changed over time. And so it really was originally about homesickness. And there is some evidence for that too, because at some point in the 20th century, like scholars started to separate their treatment of homesickness from the treatment, you know, the conceptual treatment of nostalgia. And so now we think of those things as, as really distinct. And it's also possible that both are true simultaneously, right? That the definition, how we think about it has changed while at the same time, it was underappreciated in the past that there might have been some actual psychological utility to this longing for home. But in the modern empirical world, we do lots of different types of studies, but some of the types of studies we do are experiments in which we can kind of systematically manipulate negative and positive emotions, nostalgia, or other types of cognitive experiences to really try to get you know at that causal arrow, like which is causing which. And so certainly in the last 20 years or so, we've really started to figure out, at least in the modern world, when people are experiencing nostalgia, um, it's not causing them a lot of distress like they, like they thought back then. It's actually helping them regulate distress and, and, and making them feel better. But yeah, if you read the history of this stuff, it's, some of the ideas are, are, are very fascinating and very wild, like lots of, like there was, you know, for example, there was a view that nostalgia might have been kind of a demonic component <laughs> to it, like demonic possession almost, or that there was an idea that maybe cowbells in the Alps caused um, neurological damage, you know, hearing the, the ringing of the cowbells all the time triggered neurological damage. I mean, there was a bunch of pretty bold <laughs> um, theoretical positions that, that aren't true. But yeah, it's, but it's impossible to know, you know, of course, for sure, exactly how people were, were thinking about it at that time. We, we have written records and, and all that, but definitely it's an interesting history. Right. So talking about methodological approaches of today that help us better understand nostalgia, it seems that, to my understanding, research in social psychology is focusing on aspects of the lexicon, a number of words, which in the field they are known as features. To what extent this is true? Is nostalgia a concept that can be captured in language at the word level, or should we consider larger contexts? Yeah, that's a really excellent point. So there, there are a lot of different types of ways that nostalgia has been experimentally manipulated for the reason that you articulate. So, so one common, probably the most common methodology that I've used, can speak for everyone else, but, I, but what I've used is presenting people with a dictionary definition of nostalgia and then asking them to describe, you know, in writing a nostalgic experience versus in control conditions, they describe other types of autobiographical um, memories or experiences, and then you measure, you know, a bunch of outcomes. So that's one approach. So the approach you said of where we use what's described the central or peripheral features of nostalgia kind of came about as a response to concerns that maybe by us, you know, us giving people a definition of nostalgia and having them do this task in this particular way, this writing task in this particular way, there was something inherent to that procedure that generated these effects. And so what's another way of getting at, getting at inducing nostalgia? And so that's when this idea came about. There was actually a whole bunch of studies where they developed what the central features are to begin with. So just see like what people typically associate nostalgia with. And without ever using the word nostalgia, you can induce those types of feelings. So that's one way, but that doesn't address the bigger question you asked of how much is this is, is tied to language and, and words. And so one of the things that we've also started doing a lot more in recent years is using 
other types of non-language inductions like sense or I guess it is like I guess music is language but we've also used music video and so using other ways of, of stimulating nostalgia w- without you know necessarily directly using the words of course one of the challenges in, in social and behavioral science is we often do rely on questionnaires or or inductions that involve language but I think they're you know we're starting to learn other things about other other sensory types of inputs that trigger nostalgia that provide very very similar results into the types of effects they have on psychology and on motivation I think they give us some confidence that you know these aren't just the words like there's something about that experience um, that pe- the subjective experience that people have and that they share and that is fairly common across ages and groups. Yes, for sure. It is definitely an embodied experience, which goes yeah. beyond language, which is ungrounded, unfortunately. But what about the particulars versus the universals? Is there consensus mm-hmm. across individuals and even across cultures on the definition and use of the concept of nostalgia? In your studies, which countries cultures did not seem to align with the more or less universal understanding of this concept and why? Yeah, this is a tough question for a couple of reasons. So there there are definitely studies looking at the the cross-cultural nature of nostalgia. So first I'll say in general, the correlation or the, the, the similarities across cultures are pretty high. So there does seem to be some evidence that globally, People who live in different societies of different ages generally have a similar kind of conception experience of nostalgia. That being said, you're right that there is some some variability, particularly in, I believe, African countries, there seems to be more dissimilarity. The challenge with that is if I'm remembering, this wasn't work that I did, but if I'm remembering it correctly, there's more variability in, in African cultures and it's hard to know why. Like one one possibility is there's kind of like a measurement or methodological error because it could be in a lot of these societies, there's just not as much familiarity with, you know, survey style questionnaires, which kind of gets indirectly to a previous point you made <laughs> about the, the lexicon, the word component of this. So it's hard to know, is it the case that that people in, in, in cultures, in Afri- African cultures, for instance, think about nostalgia differently or experience it somewhat differently? Or is it the methodology isn't fully capturing what would otherwise be, you know, perhaps a universal experience? There are other potential interesting differences, perhaps based on things, and I believe in in East Asian cultures, there's there's more of a kind of a view about the the balance of positive and negative emotions. Whereas in Western, more like individualistic societies, we, we tend to think positive emotions are good, negative emotions are, are bad. Again, I'm generalizing, but perhaps in, in other cultures, there'd be more of an appreciation for the complexity of emotion. That's good to have some, you know, or a view that it's good to have harmony between positive and negative. There's going to be cultural variation. And, and honestly, even though I think researchers have done a good job in like kind of painting a broad picture of the universal nature of nostalgia. I think it, uh, we don't really have a good high resolution picture where we've really gone into like specific cultures and really explored the potential variability as a function of, uh, of different histories and cultural traditions and the different things that different cultures value. And so I definitely think there's a lot of future work to do in that. But I guess the take home message would be despite some some variability and some methodological challenges. Generally speaking, it seems to be that nostalgia has universal qualities. It's not like in one culture, you know, there's strong agreement and then in other culture, they don't even know what we're talking about, right? There, it does seem to be a fairly universal experience, not just captured in research participants, but in the study of history of, you know, the study of their literature and in their art. People seem to get this idea of a longing, a sentimental longing for something meaningful in in the past. But I do think there's a lot of great work to be done, and not just by psychologists. I mean, this this shows where I think other types of experts are needed, cultural anthropologists, people in the humanities, 
people who you know have different methodologies and different approaches to perhaps really getting into the the deeper nature of, of nostalgia in distinct cultures if, if that makes sense yes it does it's such a complex concept that really takes a village an interdisciplinary right. village to to better understand it but nostalgia has also been linked to the self self esteem as well as other important dimensions you and other researchers have specifically looked at whether sent evoked nostalgia raises self-esteem. What sense seem to have the highest nostalgic evocation? I think this is fascinating, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. And it's kind of funny because at some level, seem, you, know, you know how research is, sometimes it takes a while to figure out something obvious <laughs> and and uh, at some level it seems obvious that scents would be a very like potent trigger of nostalgia there's something very old and fundamental about our memories for smells but that wasn't originally where we you know we started doing the research we with scents but when people started looking into that what they discovered was and again i i don't think we can say this universally the studies on this, I think, were largely done in, in Western cultures, if I remember correctly. But things like perfume and beyond that, like I'd say a lot of food stuff. And not surprising because nostalgia is so much about these like cherished experiences that we share with family and oftentimes foods involved, right? So for in American samples, things like pumpkin pie, <laughs> uh, you know, I think ranked pretty high, but you could imagine in different cultures, there's going to be particular cuisines or dishes or, or things, or even like different geographies. There's, you know, like the smell of the ocean or, or something like that. So, you know, it can really vary and it can also be very individual. So, so I'll give you an example for me, because it, it also showcases something else that's interesting. I think about since, which is when I smell gasoline, it kind of triggers nostalgia. And that seems kind of odd, but it's because when I was a kid, I used to do a lot of work with my dad and, you know, working with like engines and lawnmowers and things like that. And there was we often got gasoline on my hands and it's really hard. To, it's a smell that's hard to, to wash off and it's not a pleasant smell, but that's, I think that's kind of a neat feature of it. It doesn't always have to be like a positive smell it's not a pleasant smell but it's associated with something that now is really meaningful to me especially now that my dad's no longer alive and you know I miss him which is that's something I used to that was something I did with my dad it was a way for my to, to spend time with my father and so I have this smell that's very potent it's very associated with that and it's not one that's <laughs> pleasant but it's meaningful and so I think that's an a lot of times the, the scents are positive right they are the food we like but it, I just gave that example to illustrate that it, it, it's not inherently positive, right? You can't have things that from an important time in your life that had really meaningful memories to you and they don't have to be good. Yes, absolutely. In fact, when I was reading your papers and looking at your examples that sent me back to the smell of freshly washed and dried linen, right? So the clothes, yeah. because yeah. in Europe, where I'm from originally, people used to dry their clothes outside any time of the year, even in the winter, during the winter storms sometimes. And they, they have a particular smell of that really fresh. I, I cannot really describe it. So that's, yeah. that's one memory that I connected with. And another one was actually the animated movie Ratatouille, where there's yeah. a famous scene, yeah. right, of the food critic who eats the famous dish and, and is sent back with his memories to his uh, childhood home. So <laughs> we all have, have that. So I, I really found it fascinating that scent and, you know, in Ratatouille's case, also taste combination yeah. of the two very much linked to nostalgia yeah and if you think about it too even from like a, a brain level it makes sense because the smells the olfactory bulb is, is I, I think very strongly linked to brain structures such as the amygdala and hippocampus that are associated with with emotions and memory and they have research on the those types of sensory inputs of smell it's a really powerful trigger of, of emotions and autobiographical memories. So there does seem to be something very potent about 
about smell that triggers these reactions. In addition to that, like it just creates a more complete experience, right? Like to have, you know, you're not just thinking about it, like you're, you're more immersed in something if you can smell or hear or touch or things that just provide more data for the brain really to engage that experience. Yes, for sure. At the beginning of the show, you mentioned that nostalgia is a past-oriented emotion, but one that has implications for the present, as it leads to increments in self-esteem. But does it also have implications for the future? And you said yes. Yes, that is the area of work that I've been most involved in in the last several years and been most excited about. And if you do research long enough, One of the things that makes doing scientific research exciting, in my opinion, is the process of discovery more so than the experience of confirmation. So, you know, people are biased and we like our ideas to be affirmed, right? But if you, if you really embrace the idea of discovery, you will, you know, find yourself going in interesting directions that you wouldn't have necessarily predicted. And so when I first started studying nostalgia, my thinking was it was very much about what you might call a psychological defense system. You feel anxious or lonely or scared about the future. You turn to the past for comfort. And so nostalgia is good, but it's good because it stabilizes you. And so I thought of it really, it's a psychological defense, but doesn't necessarily do anything for the future except to the extent that it's good to be stabilized because it's going to be hard to approach the future if you're anxious or depressed or or lonely. So I thought about, yeah, it provides a good defense, but that's kind of the the full story. And then when we were doing this work, you know, a number of years ago, when we, we started really reading the content of people's nostalgic memories. So we asked people like, tell us, you know, tell us what makes you nostalgic and how it makes you feel. And a theme that kept coming up not in every narrative, but very frequently was a kind of ending of the memory with more future-oriented language. So people would say something like, the other day I looked back at a wedding album, a photo album from my daughter's wedding. It makes me happy to, to see everyone smiling and all of this. It really brings me back. And it also gives me hope for the future of our family. And so that's just one example. But you often saw these themes of of gratitude and inspiration and kind of a something that was like people were making a, like a, a connection from there was something important that happened in the past and we carry that forward and that inspires us into the future. So that got us thinking that well, nostalgia might not just be a defense mechanism that makes people feel secure in the present. It might actually be like a source of inspiration. Like people, when they don't know what to do, when they, when the path seems uncertain or when they feel kind of down and, you know, like they've lost their motivation or their hope, they might actually look to the past, not just to comfort the, for themselves, but for ideas, for inspiration of how to move forward, you know, for motivation. And then we started doing, you know, research looking at that. And we found that, you know, after engaging in a nostalgic reflection task, people report fear, feeling more motivated to pursue important goals. They feel more optimistic about the future. And there's behavioral evidence too that they actually do more, do more things. They give more to charity. You know, they invest more in the future. And so that was a discovery that I didn't predict. And then it kind of, you know, I don't know, maybe this was five or six years ago. It really started to get me thinking about like a different model <laughs> of nostalgia, where nostalgia wasn't even really about the past. Nostalgia involved using the past, but really it's it, what it does is it like pushes us forward. It doesn't, not just because it comforts us, because it actually like gives us some, some guidance for how to live a meaningful life and how to look at the future w- w- with hope and inspiration. And so that, that kind of really changed my, my thinking about nostalgia. Now I really do think of it as really, it's a a past-focused experience, but it's a future-oriented resource. But what about nostalgia, social connectedness, and empathy? Feeling loved, protected, connected to others, trusting others, being empathetic, and so on. Does nostalgia augment empathy? 
Yes, it seems like what nostalgia does at the general level is it brings the social self online. And so when we feel nostalgic, we really are thinking about relationships. And when we think about these relationships, it not only makes us feel more connected, it motivates us to want to connect. It motivates us to prioritize social goals over other types of goals. When we want to prioritize social goals or when we're engaged in more like social cognition, we do become more empathetic, more pro-social, more interested in helping others. And so nostalgia really brings the social and the pro-social self online, I think, and, you know, kind of can shift us away from more, I guess what you might call like more hedonistic or like immediate, like personally fulfilling things towards a more social orientation and a more future-oriented pro-social orientation. Nostalgia makes us want to plug in. It makes us want to focus on cultivating our close relationships, building new relationships, and also, you know, helping our the groups we belong to and the communities we're part of. Mm. So nostalgia can be good for us, would make us better people. Yeah, I think that's I think that's generally true is that on the whole or on average, nostalgia makes people better and more more sympathetic, more pro-social. Are there cases of nostalgia which are the negative ones that keep us stuck in the past? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that because, you know, oftentimes, when you, I'm, I'm sure you've heard me throughout the interview, try to be, at least I've tried to be careful and say, on, in general, <laughs> or typically use the language of, you know, leaving open that there are other possibilities here. For one, I think that like anything that's good or that's generally good for people, such as physical exercise, or you might say meditation or something else, some people become obsessive or they overdo it or, and that gets in the way of doing other things. So life is about pursuing all sorts of things <laughs> at the same time and then balancing those, those goals, right? So if you're spending all your time engaged in nostalgia or you're totally obsessed with nostalgia, then you're not going to have a lot of time to get the benefits of nostalgia from doing the things that nostalgia might inspire you to do. And so luckily, I don't think there, there's good reason to suspect that this is a big problem, but it could be the case that there are some people that become too stuck in, in the kind of nostalgic experience. In addition to that, I, I think it's possible that nostalgia can be manipulated in in ways that I would say aren't really how, what nostalgia naturally is, but could be exploited in some way. So like a, a particular type of political nostalgia, perhaps, where the goal is to take advantage of the fact that people have this like positivity towards the past and then use it as a way to attack uh, ideas or to, to say, oh, like things were way better and look how horrible things are. Or now we should we should just try to restore the past. So I do think there there could be kind of a weaponized version of nostalgia that's really used to divide people and, and instead of connect them. Again, I don't think that when you look at most nostalgic experiences, they tend to be very autobiographical. They're about people's own past, their own connections to others. But certainly at that larger cultural level of cultural nostalgia, you can see politicians and different people try to exploit people's anxieties and channel it into a, a nostalgia that could not be particularly healthy for, for society. Mm, yes. But overall, in general, <laughs> nostalgia <laughs> right. seems to be good for us. And um, we should encourage and probably raise our awareness, right, yes. of the concept and apply it more often. But this actually sends us to technology. Can technology help us get there? Do you think that our current scientific understanding of nostalgia allows us to use it to build immersive technologies? So, for example, virtual reality, augmented reality, immersive technologies in general. Yes, I think so. And, and, and I know that, you know, even though that's not my area of expertise, I know there's been some work in this area. A couple of years ago, I think there was some, there was research on nostalgia and augmented reality, I think using like Legos. And what they found was, I think that nostalgia was a powerful mediator of the emotion that would seem to get the account for most 
of the positive effects of using aug of augmented reality and like inspiration and creativity. And so there's something about when people feel nostalgic, you know, and Lego makes sense, right? Because a lot of people have nostalgic memories for the, for playing with physical Legos or whatever. So in the augmented reality case, I think they were using Legos and, you know, it's like a combination of that and then some kind of augmented environment with them. When people felt nostalgic about the Legos, I think they were more inspired and more creative with um, with what they were building, if I'm remembering that study correctly. But more broadly, yes, I think that what happens, I think we know enough about nostalgia to realize that that's, it's a, like I said, it's a powerful like motivator. It inspires people, it energizes people. There is some research on nostalgia and creativity that I didn't mention, like after a uh, nostalgia induction, like people are more creative and they feel more creative. I definitely think when we, when we think about technology, especially if you think about people who maybe have a resistance to technology, or there's a certain anxiety associated with technology because they don't have a lot of familiarity with it. Nostalgia might be a way to help bridge that from, hey, this is a new way of doing something. And even beyond augmented reality and virtual reality, I think if you just look at a lot of innovations in technology, a lot of times part of what makes people excited about them is it connects to something nostalgic. So you could imagine, for instance, people being more open to driving an electric truck. <laughs> if it's like, oh, I, this is the model of truck I used, you know, that I have nostalgic feelings for. And now it's just a new version using a new technology with cleaner energy. You know, when we think about approaching the, the future of technology, whether it's VR, AR, or just in general, anything we want to do to, you know, make improvements or enhancements, the more we can connect them to nostalgia, the more they will help people feel like they somehow have, it's meaningful to them and it, it, it taps into their life history and their life, life story. So I think using nostalgia in these technologies can be a way to not only ease people's anxiety about these technologies, but also just enrich, enhance the experience to make it a more complete and a more human, you know, more human experience. Yes, yes, for sure. You already gave me an answer to, to my question of what applications or nostalgia-based <laughs> uh, tools would we see there. But going back to nostalgia, because it's such a complex process, it, it really entails embodied experience and highly sensorial complex process. And it's, as you already mentioned, it's tightly connected to memories of the past. And these memories are rather unique from person to person. So my question is, when it comes to immersive technologies that bring awareness to nostalgia and make us more nostalgic or try to revive or relieve some of the memories and experience of the past, to what extent this is possible, right? So... To really, again, this sends me back to, to the food critic in, in Ratatouille, right? So all that yeah. blend of, of, of flavor and taste and smell and, and mother's presence and absolutely, you know, French country style and so on. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know for sure, but I have thought about this a lot in relation to art and how art uses nostalgia. And I, I think there might be a similarity here. And what I mean by that is if you watch a movie or a television program, that's a clear attempt to exploit nostalgia. And I don't mean exploit in a bad way, but you know, just use nostalgia. It's sometimes successful and it's sometimes not. And there's a risk of it not being successful because when people feel like nostalgia is is somehow something new is somehow violating the sacred nature of what it was in the past it often doesn't go well so if they have a special attachment to a particular movie for instance and then there's a reboot of the movie and the thing that they thought was really special is messed with in some way then people often reject it and they're like no that's not the way i remember it and so you can have nostalgia that's kind of like a, a mass market or a, an attempt to exploit consumer nostalgia that doesn't work because people feel like that what was meaningful was, was lost. What was special cannot be repeated. Now, on the other hand, you can have very, very successful 
attempts at, at capturing nostalgia to make a new product, to make a new movie, to reboot something or to continue the story. And I think in those cases, of course, it's complex. Some, you know, a lot of times there's just a bad movie and it doesn't matter if it's nostalgic <laughs> or not. It's just the, the script isn't good. The acting isn't good. The directing's not good. But when something uses nostalgia well, I think, I think a key ingredient is that it preserves that, that sentiment, what was special about it, but it makes it more fitting for modern life. It's, and this gets kind of to the historical nostalgia and to even the, some, of the, some of the ways that nostalgia could go, could be used for bad things that we briefly talked about. And that is people are moving forward. Their, their views have changed on certain things. They live in a, you know, in a more modern society. So what they're really nostalgic about the past isn't an attempt to just like totally reproduce the past as it was. It's an attempt to find the aspects, the dimensions of the past that they find that they would find useful for today. And so in the case of a movie, for instance, if a film reboots, if a, if a film franchise reboots a story and does it in a way that's not only a good movie, but feels more contemporary, and not only preserves that nostalgic experience for the original audience, the person who was maybe a kid when the original movie came out, but it helps them introduce the next generation to that. And, and it feels relevant to them too. So to me, nostalgia has an immersive experience of nostalgia. It would be better if it wasn't just an attempt to totally replicate the past, but was an attempt to say, well, here's the cool things that you, features of the past that are most central and most meaningful to you with the recognition that th life has changed and, you know, you've changed and things are going forward. And so really connecting the past to the present and to the future. And it's, it's a tricky, so how do you do that? Well, that, that's a tricky business. Um, but what I, I would suggest probably wouldn't work is just a, a total attempt to completely replicate a past memory. My guess is People would feel like, no, you can't, you can't go back. It's lost something by trying to just totally reproduce it. Like it, there needs to be something new, something fresh that preserves what was important to me, but recognize that that can't be, that can't be repeated. That, you know, it makes it lose its value if it can be perfectly repeated. Then it's not a cherished, important thing. It's a mundane thing because you can have it all the time. Is this connected to what you call nostalgic reverie? Yeah, so when, when we engage in this nostalgic reverie, when we're, not to use the movie ex example again, but the way memory works isn't like a tape recording, right? It's not, it's not like we're robots and we just play back the tape and it, it, it's exactly the same. We have the gist of the story and then over time, it, it kind of changes, right? Like it's not, it's not like people are thinking about false memories. It's just that they're engaged in kind of an editing process to, to make those memories connect better to their life narrative. I'm not just trying to go back and repeat this memory as it was. I'm trying to find something in the memory that helps me tell myself story. And so I think that editing process, that, that, engage, that active interactive engagement of the reverie, of the experience, my, you know, how you feel about it might, might change. So you know, another, an example might be, you might have a nostalgic feeling today for a specific event that happened 10 years ago. 10 years from now, you might revisit that experience again. Now it's been 20 years, you know, since the, and you might still feel like a strong attachment nostalgic to it. But now that you're older and you have different experiences, your view of it might have changed. You might, might be more complex, right? You might be like, well, now that I've had these life experiences, it feels even more meaningful to me. I know this, is, this has happened to me. You know, I remember becoming a parent and being like, oh, like this is what my mom and dad felt like at this time. <laughs> you know what I mean? So as your life becomes, um, as you go through more milestones in life and go through more experiences, the same memory can take on a different complexity or different meaning. I feel this way about, you know, using the movie example. I go back and watch a movie. I'm like, oh, I liked it back then, but now I'm getting even more out of it. Like there's something deeper that I didn't notice before because I guess I wasn't mature enough or wasn't ready or hadn't had a relevant experience. And so I think that's, I think that's actually pretty cool too because it just shows that over time we can draw on the same experiences but extract different pearls of wisdom from them. This is fascinating. And I think in a way it shows that there is a future for 
immersive technologies when it comes to nostalgia, because once you have the right cue to really induce the right, I would say, context, just let it go from there, right? And let each yeah. user discover the path. So as you said, it's a discovery and also a self-reflection process, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, I, I agree. And there would be opportunity for, really it's, a, you know, you think about it as a growth orient, you know, there's an opportunity for building upon a nostalgic experience and taking it into different directions and really goes, you know, really showcases the, that one of the common like stereotypes about nostalgia is, is false, which is that people are just stuck in the past and they're just repeating something. It's like, no, actually that's, that's not really true at all. Like most people aren't doing that. They're taking something and they're like experiencing it slightly different, different times. And they're, they're, it's connecting to different, different issues they're going through. And so they're, you know, it really is this kind of organic experience that can vary to the individual and they can really pull different things from it. And so the, it's, you know, it's a limitless resource, I suppose, if you think about it that way. A creative process for sure. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, we are now at the end of our show. I really enjoyed it. But how can our audience learn more about you, your books and your research? And how can you be reached? Probably the easiest way to reach me is I, I do have a, uh, like an email link on, on my website, which is just clayrutledge.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm not on, uh, yeah, I think Twitter's the only social media I think I'm on. And I think it's just at Clay Rutledge. But yeah, the website, there's there's links to a lot of my writing and, and videos. I've done some videos and different things for nostalgia. I wrote a TED, Ed, Ed, if you like cartoons, I wrote like a nice five five minute like overview of nostalgia and it's an animated form and I think that's a real fun video but those are probably the best places to look yeah for sure I didn't know about that I will definitely look at, at those cartoons because it, it makes it even more fun right we are actually combining modalities we're not using the same <laughs> boring right, <yeah>. text <laughs> anymore yeah. so <laughs> that's great thank you so much Clay this was great thank you so, so much for having me it, it was it was a lot of fun